I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today about uh, our work trying to develop new HIF inhibitors for cancer therapy. The hypoxia inducible factors um, serve to balance the consumption of oxygen, primarily in the mitochondria, with the delivery of oxygen um, through the uh, circulatory and respiratory systems. Um, and uh, the HIFs uh, serve as master regulators at the level of gene transcription to ensure that every one of the 50 trillion cells in your body receives adequate oxygen uh, at every moment of every day for your entire life. We started out by trying to understand um, uh, how uh, erythropoietin production was controlled in the kidney. Uh, we knew that the kidneys could uh, sense the local oxygen levels, and when oxygen delivery was inadequate, um, they would increase the production of EPO, uh, which was secreted into the bloodstream and bound to erythroid progenitors in the bone marrow to stimulate their survival, proliferation, and uh, differentiation. And we found um, a, a, a short DNA sequence that's now known as the hypoxia response element just downstream of the EPO gene. And then we used this DNA fragment to identify a transcription factor that we bound to it, that bound to it that we called hypoxia inducible factor one or HIF1. And we used the binding of HIF1 to the HRE as a way to purify HIF1 uh, from 120 liters of HeLa cells grown in suspension culture. And we found that HIF1 was a heterodimer composed of HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta subunits. So these two proteins dimerize, they bind to the HRE, and then they recruit proteins called coactivators. Um, these proteins serve as a bridge to the transcription initiation complex. In addition, they have histone acetyl transferase activity, uh, allowing them to modify the chromatin such that the RNA polymerase can access the DNA and transcribe it into RNA. And uh, we made antibodies against HIF1-alpha and HIF1-beta and measured the levels of these proteins um, in nuclear extracts from HeLa cells that were exposed to different um, oxygen levels for four hours. And what we found was that, that there was a dramatic increase in the HIF1-alpha levels in the nucleus at oxygen levels below 6%. This corresponds to uh, 40 millimeters of mercury, uh, which is uh, venous PO2. So this suggested that any decrease in oxygen availability would occur along the steep portion of this curve of providing a graded transcriptional response to hypoxia, meaning the more severe the hypoxic stimulus, the greater the expression of HIF1 alpha, which was the limiting subunit for um, uh, the formation of HIF1. The basis for this oxygen-regulated uh, expression of HIF1-alpha was discovered by three labs who reported that there were two proline residues in HIF1-alpha that were hydroxylated. Uh, and this hydroxylation was carried out by a series of prole hydroxylase domain proteins, PhD1, 2, and 3, which use oxygen and alpha-ketoglutarate as substrates. One of the oxygen atoms is inserted into a proline residue of HIF1-alpha and the other oxygen atom is used to split alpha-ketoglutarate into CO2 and succinate, making this an irreversible reaction. The hydroxylation of HIF1-alpha allows the binding of the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor protein. VHL will only bind to HIF1-alpha uh, if it's hydroxylated either at proline 402 or 564. The binding of VHL to HIF1-alpha um, leads to the recruitment of a ubiquitin protein ligase so that under normoxic conditions, um, HIF1-alpha is ubiquitinated and then degraded by the proteasome. Under hypoxic conditions, the hydroxylation reaction is inhibited. The fraction of HIF1-alpha that's hydroxylated decreases. VHL cannot bind to the non-hydroxylated form of HIF1-alpha, which is stable and rapidly accumulates within hypoxic cells. In addition to these proline residues, there's an asparagine residue in the transactivation domain that's also hydroxylated under normoxic conditions. Um, and this reaction is carried out by a protein that we originally discovered and called FIH1 for factor inhibiting HIF1 because we showed that FIH1 binds to HIF1 
and blocks its transcriptional activity. And it turned out that FIH1 um, hydroxylates asparagine 803, and this hydroxylation blocks the binding of the coactivators under normoxic conditions. Uh, the uh, hydroxylation reaction uses the same biochemistry, um, and uh, under hypoxic conditions, the reaction is inhibited, the asparagine is not hydroxylated, and now the coactivators combined, uh, making HIF1 competent to activate transcription. So you can appreciate that both the half-life of the protein and its specific transcriptional activity are regulated by these oxygen-dependent modifications. So this provides a mechanism to directly transduce changes in oxygen availability to the nucleus as changes in HIF activity. Well, we started out uh, with one HIF and one HIF target gene. Uh, and now we know uh, that uh, HIF-1 alpha has a sibling, HIF-2 alpha, uh, and HIF-2 alpha uh, is structurally and functionally similar to HIF-1 alpha. It's oxygen regulated. It can dimerize with HIF-1 beta and activate transcription. And uh, whereas uh, we had originally studied the EPO gene, we now have over 8,000 RNAs whose expression is increased in one cell type or another under hypoxic conditions in a HIF-dependent manner. Uh, some of these serve to increase oxygen delivery. So whereas EPO is a response to systemic hypoxia, local hypoxia due to impaired uh, perfusion uh, results in a production of vascular endothelial growth factor, which mediates uh, vascular responses uh, to hypoxia and ischemia. And then regardless of whether the hypoxia is systemic or local, individual cells must adapt to reduce oxygen availability and the classic metabolic adaptation is the switch from oxidative to glycolytic metabolism that's mediated by HIF-1. Well, we, we use the antibody that we generated against HIF-1-alpha to stain um, tumor uh, biopsies. And um, we often saw patterns that look like this. Um, you can see here these clear areas represent areas of necrosis where the cancer cells have died because they're too far away uh, from a blood vessel to receive adequate oxygen. Then you see these brown stained nuclei around the areas of necrosis. And these uh, are brown stained because we've treated it with the antibody against HIF-1 alpha. And you can appreciate that these are the viable cells that are furthest away from the blood vessel and therefore the most hypoxic. So you can appreciate how the pattern of expression of HIF-1-alpha within these tumors uh, is uh, related to the blood flow and uh, the local oxygen levels. And what we found was that uh, increased HIF-1-alpha expression like this in the primary tumor biopsy was associated with decreased survival in a very large number of um, solid tumors. Uh, and whereas most uh, available chemotherapy uh, targeted the dividing cells around blood vessels, um, when we started this work, there were, there were no drugs that targeted these um, hypoxic cells. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we and others looked at the levels of HIF-1-alpha in primary tumor biopsies and found that um, high HIF-1-alpha expression was associated with patient mortality uh, in uh, many different human tumors. And I've just highlighted five studies here from breast cancer. There are, there are probably twice as many, actually. Um, and uh, regardless of whether we were looking at a subpopulation such as lymph node negative or lymph node positive breast cancers or unselected populations, in all cases, um, high HIF-1-alpha was associated with patient mortality. And the reason for this is that the HIFs control the expression of genes that contribute to every critical aspect of uh, cancer biology. Well, in addition to the, uh, the um, induction of HIF activity by intratumoral hypoxia, we also know that uh, increased HIF activity can be caused by um, genetic alterations, and in particular, uh, in the von Hippel-Lindau hereditary cancer syndrome, uh, in which there's one um, VHL loss of function allele in the germline, 
and the other allele is inactivated uh, uh, in the uh, tumor tissue, leading to the development of um, clear cell renal carcinoma, uh, cerebellar hemangioblastomas, and retinal hemangioblastomas. And when the, these um, VHL null cells are, are, are taken out uh, of a tumor and put into culture, um, one can look at the levels of HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha, and you can see that regardless of whether the cells are cultured at high or low oxygen concentrations, there's very high expression of both HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha. If a wild-type copy of the VHL gene is returned to these cells, then the normal physiological regulation with the oxygen-dependent degradation of HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha occurs. And what's known is that these cells with dysregulated HIF activity uh, will form tumors. These cells will not. Uh, and so it was very exciting uh, when uh, these results were published, a phase one trial of, um, of this drug, Belzutifan, in patients with renal cell carcinoma. And the results were quite um, amazing uh, with uh, the number of patients who had either a partial response or stable disease uh, equaling 80% of, um, of this trial. And the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved Belzutifan uh, for the treatment of renal cell carcinoma in August of uh, last year. And Belzutifan's mechanism of action is that it binds directly to HIF2-alpha and blocks its interaction with HIF1-beta thereby uh, inhibiting um, HIF transcriptional, HIF2 transcriptional activity um, within uh, the tumors. A side effect that's reported in about 90% of patients is anemia. Uh, this is a direct on-target effect uh, because of the inhibition of uh, EPO production um, leading to anemia. I'm going to speak about our studies in hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which is the third leading cause of cancer death worldwide and the most rapidly growing cancer diagnosis in the U.S. over the last two decades um, because uh, it, of the um, predisposition uh, uh, for fatty liver to develop into hepatocellular carcinoma. And so this is one of the sequelae of the epidemic of obesity in the United States. Unfortunately, most patients with hepatocellular carcinoma have advanced disease at the time of diagnosis with few treatment options available and a five-year survival of less than 15%. The first approved drugs for advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, so of course, if the the tumor is limited, surgeons can perform a partial hepatectomy and remove the tumor, but once it's spread beyond the uh, liver, um, then systemic therapy is required. And the first drugs were the so-called mixed kinase inhibitors, such as serafinib and levantinib, which provided only a modest survival benefit with low response rates, high toxicity, and the frequent development of resistance. Uh, there were uh, many trials uh, of uh, immuno-oncology drugs, such as nivolumab, an anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, which was granted FDA approval based on phase two trial data. Uh, but the phase three trial of nivolumab versus serafinib did not meet the primary um, uh, endpoint of uh, increased overall survival. Uh, another anti-PD-1 antibody, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, went to phase three trials uh, versus placebo as second line treatment uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma. And, and this trial um, also did not meet its, uh, its primary uh, endpoint. Um, and then finally, uh, the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, an anti CDLA4 antibody, um, resulted in a response rate of about 33%. Uh, and as you know, when these two drugs are combined, uh, there's a greatly increased risk of um, adverse events um, uh, due to the um, effects on the immune system. Well, a number of studies have looked at the expression of HIF-1-alpha in uh, primary tumor biopsies, and 
uh, found that uh, the HIV-1 alpha protein expression is increased in about 60% of cases of hepatocellular carcinoma and is associated with decreased disease-free and overall survival and an increased risk of recurrence after radiation or surgery. So we performed a, a cell-based screening assay, um, and, and the, the assay is, is shown here. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma cells were stably transfected with two reporters, one in which firefly luciferase um, was driven by a hypoxia res response element upstream of a basal SV40 promoter. Um, and uh, so this uh, will result in hypoxia-induced firefly luciferase activity. And then there was a control reporter in which renal luciferase was driven just by the basal SV40 promoter. So the ratio of firefly to renal luciferase activity is a measure of HIF activity within the cells. And so we exposed the cells um, uh, to 20% or 1% oxygen. And you can see that there's about a 20-fold increase in the ratio of firefly to renal luciferase in cells that have been cultured under hypoxic conditions for 24 hours. If we add small molecule and uh, small, small molecule drugs, we can test whether they block luciferase activity. And you can see that this drug shown here, 32134D, um, was able to effectively um, inhibit uh, the um, firefly to renal luciferase activity um, at a concentration of uh, five micromolar. We then went on to test the, ex the effect of uh, 32134D and another related compound that we had identified uh, in the same hepatocellular carcinoma cells uh, exposed to 1% um, oxygen for 24 hours. And we looked at the expression of CA9. This is a gene that's controlled by HIF1. And you can see there's about an 80-fold induction of gene expression under hypoxic conditions. And this is very potently inhibited at very low um, micromolar concentrations by these two um, compounds. In contrast, uh, uh, PT2385, which is a drug very similar to belzutifan in terms of its structure, had no effect because these drugs only inhibit HIF2 activity. And so the expression of this HIF1 target gene was unaffected by treatment with this drug. Uh, the, the EPO is, of course, a HIF2 target gene that's expressed in these same uh, hepatocellular carcinoma cells. You can see uh, over 30-fold induction of EPO in response to hypoxia. Um, this is, again, potently inhibited by low micromolar concentrations of these uh, novel uh, drugs. Uh, and you can see that HIF2 expression is also uh, inhibited by um, uh, PT2385. So PT2385, belzutifan, they can only inhibit HIF2 target genes. Uh, 32134D can inhibit both HIF1 and HIF2 target genes. We did RNA-seq to look at the expression of all of the genes in these cells, and we found remarkably that there were over 3,000 genes whose expression was induced uh, by exposure of the HIF3B cells to 1% oxygen for 24 hours. And um, Eighty-six percent of those genes were inhibited by 32134D. Uh, on the flip side, there were over 4,000 genes that were inhibited by 32134D uh, at 1% oxygen, and 71% of those were hypoxia-induced genes. So the, the compound is having a very selective effect on um, hypoxia-induced uh, HIF target gene expression. Well, we uh, injected the HEP3B cells into nude mice, allowed the tumors to grow to a volume of uh, approximately 150 millimeters cubed. Uh, and then we started treatment uh, either with vehicle or increasing concentrations of 32134D injected intraperitoneally on a daily basis. And you can see that compared to the um, vehicle treated animals, the animals treated with 32134D um, has significantly decreased um, tumor growth. And you can see that the maximum therapeutic dose was 40 milligrams per kilogram per day because 80 milligrams per kilogram gave the same um, level of, of tumor control. You can see that the treatment had no effect on mouse body weight. It also had no effect on their appearance or behavior. 
At the end of the experiment, we harvested the tumors and analyzed the expression of HIF1 alpha and HIF2 alpha within the tumors. You can see that the tumors from vehicle treated mice had very high levels of both HIF1 alpha and HIF2 alpha, and those treated with 32134D had very low levels of these um, proteins. So the drug inhibits the degradation of HIF1 alpha and HIF2 alpha in vivo. Well, uh, we, we, went, we found, of course, that the tumor weight was significantly decreased in animals treated with the HIF inhibitor. And when we uh, uh, observed these tumors, after we took them out, um, the tumors from the uh, 32 d treated mice were much paler, um, suggesting that there was an effect on angiogenesis. And so we stained for blood vessels, and you can see these very large blood vessels um, uh, in the section from animals treated with vehicle and tumors from animals treated with 32134D. The blood vessels are here, but they're very small, indicating that the perfusion of the tissue is significantly reduced uh, when the animals are treated with uh, this novel HIF inhibitor. And so we looked at the expression of various angiogenic growth factors that stimulate blood vessel formation, and we found that they were uniformly reduced in their expression at both the RNA level and also at the protein level, um, performing a lysis using um, tumor lysates. So it's clear that 32134D can inhibit tumor growth and angiogenesis, that it inhibits multiple angiogenic growth factors. And in addition, we saw inhibition of several uh, proteins that are involved in immune evasion. Uh, so the ability of the cancer to evade the immune system. Uh, and as a result, we um, looked at the effect of anti-PD-1 antibody in this model. Sorry, we had to go to a syngeneic mouse model. So now we're using HEPA-1-6. This is a mouse hepatocellular carcinoma cell line that can be put into syngeneic C57L mice that have an intact immune system. Uh, and you can see that the uh, uh, animals that were treated with a uh, isotype control antibody, the tumors grew very rapidly. The animals had to be euthanized, um, whereas anti-PD-1 therapy reduced tumor growth and in a quarter of the animals um, resulted in tumor eradication. Although you can see in several cases, the tumors came back after the anti-PD-1 uh, therapy was stopped. When we treated with 32134D uh, at 40 milligrams per kilogram per day, you can see that was really significant to, uh, uh, inhibition of tumor growth, and we saw a tumor eradication in a third of the mice. We then asked what happens if you combine these two therapies, and the result was quite dramatic. Uh, we saw tumor eradication in two-thirds of the mice. So this would be a, a really remarkable advance if it could be translated uh, to the clinic. So we wanted to know how did the HIF inhibitor improve the response to the anti-PD-1 immunotherapy? And so we looked, uh, we took out the tumors, um, dissociated them into individual cells, and then performed flow cytometry to identify different immune cell populations within the tumor. <clears throat> and we compared tumors from mice that have been treated with vehicle or 32134D alone for five days. Um, and what you can see is that there's a significant effect, a, a significant increase in the percentage of uh, CD8 positive uh, effector T cells, a significant increase in natural killer cells. So these are the two populations that are responsible primarily for anti-tumor immunity. Uh, and in contrast, the percentage of tumor-associated macrophages and myeloid-derived suppressor cells was decreased. And these are uh, immune cell populations that, mean, that mediate immunosuppression. So we dramatically shifted the balance from favoring immunosuppression to favoring uh, anti-tumor immunity by treating with the HIF inhibitor for just five days. What was responsible for the change in the cell populations? Uh, this was a change in the expression of a very large number of cytokines. So here we've performed uh, a, um, uh, a 
uh, RT-QPCR array looking at the expression of RNAs encoding a large number of cytokines and all of the, uh, the cytokines in this quadrant were significantly decreased in tumors from animals treated with 32134D as compared to control. And you can see multiple uh, uh, cytokines that, and, uh, that are known to uh, promote immunosuppression, including VEGF, uh, including uh, IL-10, uh, and uh, 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 a, a number of the cytokines that are responsible for uh, promoting uh, immunosuppression. And uh, there were very few that, uh, RNAs encoding cytokines that were increased after treatment with uh, 32134D, but two of them are very notable, CXCL9 and CXCL10. These are the chemokines that are responsible for the recruitment of CD8-positive T cells and natural killer cells. And another was interferon gamma, which is a measure of immune cell activation. So this provides us with the mechanism uh, by which the uh, immune tumor cell microenvironment was changed so dramatically in response to treatment with the HIF inhibitor. Uh, and we showed that a number of these changes in RNA <clears throat> were also uh, translated into changes in protein expression. Here you can see a significant increase in CXCL9 and CXCL10 protein in uh, tumors from animals treated with 32134D and significant decreases in VEGF and interleukin-10 uh, in, in those tumors as well. Uh, we also looked to see whether 32134D had any effect on um, uh, red blood cell production, and we saw, uh, we saw no change in hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cell count, or um, uh, plasma EPO levels in animals treated with 32134D. It seems as though the drug specifically has an effect on cancer cells and does not have a, an effect on, um, on normal cells. So just to summarize, uh, we've shown that 32134D uh, can uh, inhibit HIF activity by causing the degradation of HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha when it, within hepatocellular carcinoma cells. Uh, and uh, we know that the HIFs are, are playing a very large role uh, in uh, both tumor vascularization and in immune evasion within these, these uh, hepatocellular carcinomas, and that inhibiting um, HIFs uh, has a dramatic effect. Um, uh, leading to a um, uh, improved response to immunotherapy, um, which again, if uh, translated to the clinic, uh, would result in a significant increase in uh, patient survival. Uh, all of the work on 34, 32134D was performed by a very talented and hardworking uh, postdoc uh, from Canada, China. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today.